tree today, so we're just going to go ahead and uh, you'll be able to hear my comments. I'm going to do my writing. Um, I'll, do it on the, I'll do it on the screen so you can see it to the best of my ability. If I have to, I'll go ahead and uh, put it up on the screen, okay? Uh, up on the board, I should say. So, uh, December 31st, 2017, Cool, Will, cool Wear Inc. had a balance in its prepaid insurance account of 48400 During 2018, 86000 was paid for insurance. At the end of 2018, after adjusting entries were recorded, the balance in the prepaid account was 42000 And this wants to know what the insurance expense is. So, this is... Uh, Chapter 3, we talked about adjusting journal entries and how you would have to adjust accounts accordingly for a fact pattern like this. And uh, remember, when we talked about that chapter, I had mentioned taking an approach where you would give the beginning balance. You would do whatever the ads were to that account you would do whatever the subtracts were from that account and that would lead you to what? The ending balance? Okay. And um, your best bet is to just go ahead and do it this way and then see if you can solve for whatever the unknown is. And you'll be seeing, I'd say, a good four or five questions like this on Wednesday on your exam. Okay. So they tell me that uh, there was a beginning balance of what? 48.4, right? 2017's ending balance is 2018's beginning. So you just go ahead and put that 48.4 in there. And then they say that during the year they paid 86000 for insurance. Well, the purchase of the insurance would be the add to the prepaid account, right? So I go ahead and pop in 86000 and guys, I hope you brought your calculators today to help along with this process. So what do I have here as a subtotal? Huh? Thank you. 134400 you say? Okay, good. Thank you. And then uh, they tell me that... Um, after adjusting entries, record the balance in the prepaid account was 42000 So that's at the end of 2018. So that in this case, they give me the ending balance of what, 42000 So what I do to get the answer is I take a little side calculation of 134400 minus the 42000 and that should give me the answer here of 92400 Huh? Okay, that to me is the best way to do it. Beginning balance, add, you get a subtotal. If it got up to 134,400 before the subtract, which is the insurance that is expiring, right? Is what the subtract from the prepaid account is. We would debit the prepaid credit, uh, debit the insurance expense, excuse me, credit the prepaid, and you would end up with that ending balance of 42,000. Any question on that? Okay, good. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at this next one. Cal Farmers reported supplies of two million this year. The supplies account decreased by two hundred thousand during the year to an ending balance of four hundred thousand. What is the cost of the supplies that purchase? Now this one's a little bit different and that they tell me the ending balance and they don't come right out and tell me what the beginning balance was but they tell me that it had decreased what? 200,000 to end up with an ending balance so that means the beginning balance good must be 600,000 so there's that little extra wrinkle for some of these that I got out of the test bank that uh, you'll see on Tuesday versus, I mean on Wednesday versus some others where they just give you the beginning balance, okay? Then what? We have the ads and the ads is the cost of supplies purchased, right? So isn't that the unknown here? We don't know what that number is. They tell me that uh, what? The supply expense, which would be the subtract, 
is 2 million. And then they tell me that they had an ending balance of 400,000. They just gave me that number, right? So that means that I had what? Before I had any ads, I had a subtotal here that says subtotal of what? 2,400,000? So that means that I must have added, I must have purchased what? 1,800,000 if I'm doing my math right. Okay, so I must have purchased 1,800,000 to get up to what? From 6 to 2.4 so that when I take my expense of 2 million I end up with 400,000. Okay, now you look at these solutions guys and they're using T accounts here, whatever. I mean, if that works better for you, fine. I like doing it the way I'm showing you, okay? But uh, you can see that the book maybe has a different approach. Okay, good. Number nine, stop me if you have a question. Uh-huh. Question, do it my way again? Yeah. Okay, well, I'll explain what, what I did. You yeah. see how I got the six and the four, right? Yeah. And then they told me that... Um, they had um, um, that they had had expense of two million, right? So two million is a subtract, isn't it? Okay, so I'm sitting there and I'm saying, well, if I ended up with four after subtract of two, I must have had at least two point four, right? So that could subtract that, okay? And so then I'm saying, well, how do I get from two point four? From six, I should say two point four. I had to add one point eight, right? To then be able to subtract two to end up with four. Okay, that's the logic that I'm doing. And I sometimes forget to write down um, the um, the little side calculation, which would be to take two million four hundred thousand and subtract the six hundred thousand to get to the one point eight. I mean, that is a side calculation you have to do, right? Okay. Okay. What I like about doing them the way I do them, obviously I like doing them the way I do them because that's how I do them. But I like to be systematic about it so that no matter what they're asking me, ending balance, beginning balance, whatever, when you start seeing, sometimes they use a T account, sometimes in the solution they just leap to a huge assumption in there. I standardize these. I do them the same way every single time so that if I don't get one of the answers, I'm quickly going back up into my calculations to see why I'm not getting the right answer. And if I'm still not getting the right answer, I just guess. Okay. What you don't want to do is be wasting a bunch of time not being able to get anything out of this. Okay. Number nine, which of the following is not a required disclosure for related party? Remember, related party transactions are okay, but they have to be disclosed, don't they? Okay, so we'd want to know what is the nature, what is the description of the transaction, uh, what are the amounts related to, due to the related parties. Impact of the transaction on current year's net income is not a required disclosure. Okay, so we had... A couple slides there where we called out some of the related party disclosures. It's okay to have related party to transaction, but it has to be disclosed, right? Okay. Number 10, a subsequent event for an entity with a December 31st, 2018 year end would not include and um, change in estimate, guys, we handle what? Prospectively, don't we? We don't have to go back and say, well, we have this change in estimate the next year and disclose all that. It just goes forward, right? We don't have to restate anything. Uh, issuance of bonds in January 2019, yeah, before we have gone ahead and issued the financial statement, sure, why not? We should disclose that as subsequent event. Acquisition of another company, major uncertainty. I mean, that's clearly the area that they really want us to do related, have related party disclosure with. <clears throat> Number 11, stop me if you have a question. 
Number 11, how are management's responsibility and the auditor's opinion on internal control representing the unqualified report? The auditor's responsibility and management's responsibility are clearly called out. We looked at that when we looked at uh, Apple's audit opinion from EY. We saw that they say our responsibility is to give an opinion. Management is responsible for the financial statements, right? Number 12, in his first year of operation, Acme Corp had income taxes before tax, of four, uh, had income, excuse me, before tax of 400,000. Acme made income, tax, made income tax payments totaling 150. During the tax year, it had an income tax rate of 40%. What is the balance in the income tax payable? Okay, so again, if we take the base approach, beginning adds, subtracts ending balance and beginning balance is a piece of cake for us here it's what for our tax payable is zero because we just started operations okay now income before tax is four hundred thousand but if we have a tax rate of forty percent we have to take four hundred thousand times point four that's going to be this hundred and sixty thousand is the add to our tax liability but when we make payments, payments are the subtract, aren't they? So if we've made payments of what? 150,000, then we must be left with an ending balance in our tax payable of $10,000, right? Question? Okay, good. Again, they're using T accounts. I, don't, I guess you could use T accounts. Okay, now this one is a little different, and I do kind of agree uh, with their approach because they've got two uh, as to how they answered it. So I would say the way they answered it is probably the way, the best way to answer this. And that you have two insurance policies. Okay, you have a liability policy, 36000 for 18 months. And then I guess this crop damage policy, which is 12,000 for a two year term. And they're asking the balance in the insurance, uh, prepaid insurance by the end of the year, okay? And I kind of like the approach they took here. I think it's very efficient to take the one policy, which is an 18 month, that's not dollars, 18 month policy so you have the 18 months and uh, if it was a 18 month policy and we bought it January 1st by December 31st we've used up what we've used up 12 months of that haven't we so the only thing that's left in the prepaid is the six months 18 month policy we've used up 12 so six months is left so whatever we paid for the policy times six eights gives us what's left there, 12,000, and then for the da crop damage policy, it was what? Two year term, and we still have 12 months left to go, don't we? On that, and so that's going to give me uh, 6,000 for that one. So the ending balance is what? 18,000. Okay, now I just added this question 14 using the same facts as question 13 prepare the adjusting journal entry. Now, how would I do that? Well, I would look and I'd see that they paid, what, 36000 for the first policy. They paid 12000 for the second policy. And then what? They're saying that still left in the prepaid is 18000 So I would go ahead and I would subtract the 18000 Somebody got a number here for me? 36 plus 1248 minus 18, what's that, 30,000? So that means 30,000 has expired, hasn't it? Okay, so I would go ahead and debit insurance expense 30,000 and credit the prepaid, right? And you might do them separately for each policy, I don't know, but eventually I'm gonna have to credit total 30,000 prepaid insurance. Yes, sir. This one up here, the tax? You mean the 13? Um, yeah. Um, they told me that they bought the policy on January 1st, right? 
and they tell me it's an 18 month policy. So if it's an 18 month policy and they're asking me at December 31st, 2018, 12 months have gone by, haven't they? Right? Balance means what is the balance, what's remaining in the prepaid insurance account. That's right. So there would have been only the six months left, right? And then uh, for the other one, it's 12 of the total 24. And that gave me the balance in the prepaid. And then uh, what I did was um, subtracted that from the total that was paid. That part must have expired, right? And so I would I would debit insurance expense thirty thousand and credit the prepaid thirty thousand. We're good. Okay. Okay. Good. Number fifteen. Fink Insurance collected premiums of eighteen thousand from his customer during the current year. The adjust balance of the deferred premium account increased from six million to eight million dollars during the year. What is the revenue from the insurance? Now, you look at that and you're like, well, what is this, um, you know, deferred premiums and all that? This is like deferred revenue, isn't it? It works exactly the same as deferred revenue. And they're telling us how much they've taken of revenue. That is the subtract from the deferred revenue, right? Now, again, I'm going to go with our little B, A, S, E on this. I do not like this explanation at all. And uh, uh, so we sit here and we have what? They collected premiums of 18000 And guys, when I do these problems, I just go with the energy of the question. Whatever number they give me, I just fill it in. I know that they have purchased $18 million. They tell me that the adjusted balance in the deferred premium count increased from $6 million. That's the beginning balance, isn't it? To what? Uh, to eight million at the end of the year, right? The ending balance. So all I have to do is figure out what the subtract was. That's going to be the revenue, right? So I go ahead and I add that up. That gives me twenty-four million. And then I'll go ahead and do my little side calculation. Twenty-four million minus what? 8 million means that they must have subtracted 16 million from the deferred premium account to end up with that any balance, right? And that's the amount of revenue that would have been recognized. You see how this approach keeps you grounded? If you start trying to, you know, look at what the book does and, you know, every but he's got like their own little style thing going on as to how they answer these questions. That's a good way to get yourself lost into a sea of uncertainty. If you set them up the same way every time, you just fill in whatever it is they're asking, right? Okay. Pretty easy question here. Tim Toys borrows 300000 on November 1st. And they want to know what is the balance of interest payable on December 31st. How many months is that? Two months. Count on your fingers, guys. Always sit, I'll sit there and say all November, all December. I don't care how silly you feel because it's very easy to look at November and say into December, say, okay, that's one month. Okay, I make that mistake all the time until I just force myself to count the months on my fingers like that. Times the interest rate, times the two twelfths piece of cake. Number, oh, I can put the screen down, I think. Was I doing some of them on the wall? I wasn't paying attention to where the screen was. I mean, where the wall, <laughs> where the screen was and where the wall was. Okay, number 17, Dave's Duds reported cost of goods sold to two million this year. The inventory account increased by two hundred thousand during the year and had an ending balance of four hundred thousand. What is the cost of the merchandise purchase? So now we're going to analyze what inventory using B A S E. Good. See, I got you hypnotized into it now, right? Okay. So you had what? You had ending of. 400, you had what? 
beginning of must have been what 200 okay they want to know the ads the subtract is the cost of goods sold isn't it from inventory so that must have been two million okay so if you do our little subtotal thing two million four hundred thousand how do you get from two million four hundred thousand to to, from 200 to 2 million four hundred thousand you must have to add what 2200 which is the purchases two million thank you two million two hundred thousand I mean after a while these start to become ridiculously easy right meanwhile I think if you look in the test bank they'll call these medium they call them difficult Okay, number 18, Popson Inc. incurred a material loss that was unusual in character. This loss should be reported as a discontinued operation. No, that's when we shut down a part of particular segment of the business. B, a line item between income from continuing operations and income from discontinued operations. No, it's not what it's not going to be called out separately it is a part of my continuing operations but it would be its own line item right number 19 provincial Inc reported the following tax rate Provincial reported the following amount of income tax expenses, a separate line item in its income statement. So remember, in our income statement, we have what? We have the section for ops. We have the section for what? Non-ops. And then we have tax separately. Then we would have income from continuing ops. And then we would go into what? Considering we had them discontinued, we don't have to have them, but if we did, and we do those net of tax, don't we? And so the tax is showing for the continuing operations, right, as a separate line item. And so if they give me loss on the discontinued operations, that is going to be backed out on the side, right? And so operating income, though, I would take the 600000 times the tax rate of point three that's going to give me what 180,000 separately reported income tax I'll just write it right there okay good question say again if losses are taxable? Um, no, but what they do is they shield us from having to pay income tax. So that loss would come off of the income from continuing operations, and as a result, our, ta our, um, our net income goes down, thus our tax goes down. And so you report it, the loss, net of tax, you back out the income tax benefit. Is that what they were saying here, that this was a loss? So what we would do is we take the loss and we take that hundred thousand and then we multiply it times 0.7 because we're reporting it net of tax and we'd have the 70,000 and that discontinued uh, net of tax would be reported as a $70,000 loss because it's net of tax it's a $70,000 loss because we got to shield $30,000 from income tax because that reduced our net income down a hundred thousand right so we're reporting the loss net of tax question on that okay okay good um, number 20 uh, principal benefit of I might as well go ahead and scroll it up now since I've shown you the answer a principal benefit of separately reporting discontinued operations is to enhance the predictability availability of future profitability. Remember guys, we want to show the users how our company is going to be still looking going forward, right? 
So we back out that discontinued operations part from everything else. So users can look at that and say, that part's going away. That part will not be there in the future, right? And so it helps us with the predictability of income. Remember, our financial information should provide us some feedback value, but also what? Some predictive value. Okay. Number 21. On August 1st, 2018, Rocket Retailers adopted a plan to discontinue its catalog sales division, which qualifies as a separate component of the business according to GAP regarding discontinued operations. All that is just to tell you, treat it the way we've talked about for the discontinued operations. That's all it's telling you. Okay. Now, the disposal of the division was expected to be concluded by June 30th, 2019. On, and this is the tricky part of this question. Be careful with questions and the dates if they give you a funky fiscal year end like that because nobody thinks of a fiscal year ending on January 31st, which is what's going on here. Okay, So it says, on January 31st, 2019, Rocket's fiscal year end, the following information relative to the discontinued operations was accumulated. So operating losses from February 1st, 2018 to January 31st, 2019, that's the fiscal year in which they what? Decided to discontinue that, didn't they? So we take all of the operations from that year and we put that into discontinued operation, don't we? They're tricking you by giving you these in these different dates to get you to try to think that you don't take the lot, you only take the losses for the period what? after they've made the decision. You take the losses for the entire period, don't you? Okay, so I know I gotta pick up that 115. Then they tell me, and they're asking me for the year ended January 31st, 2019. So I know I take that 115, that's the loss for the whole 12 months during fiscal, I guess that's fiscal 18, whatever, from January 1st, 20, February 1st, 2018 to January 31st, 2019. That's 12 months, right? Okay, then what? Then they have, tell me the estimated loss that will happen, the estimated losses that will happen from February 1st of 2019 to June 30th of 2019. Well, that's next year, isn't it? Do I take those in 2019 or in 2020? Fiscal 2020 here or whatever it is, fiscal 2019. It's in that next year. It's in year two, isn't it? Okay. And then how about impairment of the division assets at January 31st, 2019? Do I take that in year one or year two? Year one, because the impairment happened in year one. Remember that one slide where I sit there and I say that you follow and you follow the rules? It's what? Loss from operation, impairment loss, disposal gain or loss. All of these amounts are taken in the period in which they occur net of tax. Remember I said that one slide? Pretty much told you everything, okay? Now, we don't have the tax rate here now, having said net of tax, so I guess we have to ignore it. They said before income taxes. So, 10,000. So the answer is what here, 125? Okay, good. Number 22, on November 1st, Jameson Inc. adopted a plan to discontinue its barge division which qualifies as a separate component of the business according to GAP regarding discontinued operations. In other words, it's a discontinued operations question. That's all that means. Okay. Now, we say the disposal of the division was expected to be concluded um, by April 30th, 2019. On December 31st, 2018, the company's year end, the following information was available. And we have operating losses from January 1st to December 31st, 2018. Do we take all of that? That's the what? L in lid, loss in operation. Estimated operating losses for next year? No. How about excess of fair value, less cost to sell over book value? That's the trick. We don't take gains, we take what? We take the losses. That's an impairment loss that we take. Not There's no impairment gain or there's no gain at that point in time. That was a gain, wasn't it? So we only take the 65 million. Do you write assets up above their fair value? Things like this and the discontinued operations, fixed assets and whatnot? No, you don't write them up. You only write them 
down. This one was going to need to be right written up, wasn't it? Okay, so that's a little bit tricky. Question on that one? Uh oh, here comes a CPA question. One of the elements of financial statement is comprehensive income. Comprehensive income excludes changes in equity resulting from, and we said it was all changes in equity except what? From owner sources, right? Which is uh, um, uh, distribution to owner and what? Sales of stock, so not sales of stock, not dividends, right? Okay, so how about dividends, Paige? Which one excludes? A is excluded, isn't it? Okay, now you look at these other prior period error correction. Well, look, if I made an error in a prior period, that's going to be what? That would affect my retained earnings, wouldn't it? Because I make a cumulative effect adjustment to the beginning balance of retained earnings, or I would restate any periods presented. So that would affect net income. Uh, unrealized loss on investment, and that is going to affect my comprehensive income. Remember, comprehensive income is what? Net income plus other comprehensive income. With me so far? And OCI, remember we have the mnemonic what? Puffy, which was pension adjustments unrealized holding gains and losses on available for sale securities foreign currency translation adjustment and effective cash flow hedge and guys we don't understand all of these I realize that I know that's a little frustrating but some of these things are advanced accounting topics like the effective cash flow hedge the foreign currency translation adjustment and we just wouldn't have time to explain every single one of those but if you use that puppy mnemonic then you could also realize this. Loss from discount is part of OCI. Uh, loss from discontinued operations is part of net income, isn't it? Question? Sorry, guys, I'm walking. Your question on that one? Huh? Okay. Question? Okay, good. Let's look at number 24. Which of the following is a component of other comprehensive income? So this is just asking about the OCI part now, right? Asking me about Puffy. So how about unrealized holding gain? or loss on trading securities. No, so I guess we gotta be a little more specific on the U in unrealized. It's unrealized gain or loss on available for sales. Trading securities go straight through the income statement, don't they? Trading securities? Unrealized holding gains and loss run straight through the income statement. How about cumulative currency translation adjustment? That sounds like it's it. That's the F in Puffy, isn't it? Translation adjustment. Okay. How about changes in market value of inventory? That's part of my operating income, isn't it? Okay. How about minimum accrual of vacation pay? Again, part of my net income, right? So the answer is B here. How should the effect of a change in accounting principle that is inseparable from a change in accounting estimate be reported? By footnote disclosure? By restating the financial statements? Change in accounting principle that is inseparable from a change in accounting estimate? I change my depreciation method. I go from straight line, I, I, let's say I started double declining balance. I have an accelerated depreciation. 
And then after three years of depreciating that asset, I change to straight line. Now you look at that and you say, well, that's a change in accounting principle. But some people said, no, that's a change in accounting estimate because you thought that the asset was going to depreciate quickly in its earlier years and later, it's slower in its later years. And now you're saying that it depreciates straight line. So that's really a change in estimate. And someone else says, no, it's a change in principle. No, estimate. So people were getting beat up over it and so FASB came and said settle down you all it's a change in estimate and you will treat it as such so a change in accounting principle that is inseparable from a change in accounting estimate like a change in depreciation methods can't treat it as a change in estimate how do we handle change in estimates huh go forward prospectively right so is it true that we would make a restate prior periods no that's going backwards isn't it Okay, we don't restate any prior periods. It says, uh, as a correction of an error, as a component of income from continuing operations, yes, we just go forward and we calculate whatever the depreciation expense in that example for the current year using straight line in this little example, right? So what's the answer? D. Change in accounting principle that is inseparable from a change in accounting estimate is handled how? As a change in estimate. Okay, good. Number 26. On January 2nd, year 3, to better reflect the variable use of only machine, Holly elected to change its method of depreciation. Stop. They're changing the method of depreciation, aren't they? We know that, so let's look at the choices. Is it a cumulative effect? No cumulative effect. Cumulative effect is what? Change in accounting prints treated as a change in accounting principle. We restate any prior periods presented and we make a cumulative effect adjustment uh, to the beginning balance of the earliest of the beginning balance of the early, earliest period presented, right? We make an adjustment to the beginning balance of the earliest period presented. Okay, so no, it's not a cumulative effect. Is it correct treatment is not provided? Okay, well, let's read the other two. Cumulative effect? No, it's not a cumulative effect. Adjustment to begin and retain earnings? No, we just go forward, don't we? Cumulative effect is when you... Uh, when you go and you restate any periods presented and you make an adjustment to the beginning retained earnings of the earliest period presented, right? If there are no uh, comparative statements, you just make a cumulative effect adjustment to the beginning balance of the only period presented, right? Okay, guys, this is not texting time. If I keep looking at you, waiting for you to put the text down, and all I can see is a blur where your fingers are supposed to be. I'm going to have to ask you to stop that. Okay, um, number 27. Okay, we made pretty good time. I didn't just worry we wouldn't get to this. So they give me a trial balance. And um, question 169. And so you'll get a question, guys, almost exactly like this. Just different numbers, okay, as your full-blown problem. By the way, just to clarify, we are going to have 15 multiple choice and one full-blown, right? That was the agreement? Yeah, and I think that's the better deal for you. I think, you know, I'd like to have more to give you more chance, more margin for error. But by the same token, if I give you so many, you're just rushing through and not able to get to everything. So I'd rather just do the 15. What did we say? 80 of the points will come from the multiple choice and... 20 from this. Sorry, it'll be a question just like this. Something like this. Pretty, pretty much like this. So we go through and they want the multiple step income statement. Um, let's do this because rather than me sit here and scribble it so that you can't figure out what the hell I'm writing here. Why don't we just go ahead and let's take this approach. We're going to say which of these is going to be operating. 
which of these is going to be what? Non-operating, what's going to be tax, and what is going to be um, discontinued operations if we have them, and what will be other comprehensive income if we have them? Okay, and I think that's a little better way for us to go through this, and then we'll just look at the answer. Okay, so how about revenue? Yeah. Operating, good. How about interest revenue? Non-operating, good. How about gain on sale of invest uh, gain on sale of investments? Good, non-operating. How about foreign currency translation adjustment? Good, OCI, right? Okay, well, I don't think I skipped anything, so I must have wrote the wrong thing next to something. So this is operating? And interest revenue is? Non-operating. And what's this next one? Gain on sale of investment, which is? Non-operating. Then what? Oh, unrealized? Okay, that's going to gain on investments. Well, <clears throat> you know... It needs to be more specific. I believe this was on available for sales security because if it's an unrealized gain on a trading, it's part of my non-operating, right? So I'll make sure that when I'm giving you that on the test, I don't have that ambiguity in there. So if it's AFS, it's what? It's part of OCI? I think that was the case here. How about foreign currency translation? OCI, good. How about cost of goods sold? Operating. Operating, good. How about selling expenses? Good. Goodwill impairment loss. Goodwill impairment loss, guys, is operating. Okay, if you take a hit in your goodwill, you have to write that down. It's just like any impairment in any asset. Remember we had the write down from the inventory? We had write down on inventory? That's in a sense an impairment. So that's part of your operation. Think about it this way. I gave you the example. We have good. We have a, a restaurant, right? And we have all this goodwill. And then one day we're whipping up some pancakes, and we, you know, dump cleanser in it or something. I don't know. And gee, everyone's like, oh, I got sick at that restaurant. Don't go there anymore." Well, that's going to impair our goodwill. But that's part of the cost of doing business. Stuff happens. Sometimes you have a loss there. So that's part of part of operating. That's part of you know doing business. It's not, think about it, it's not non-operating. We incurred this loss because something happened in our business, didn't it? Well, give me an example of something that's not happening in our business that would impair our goodwill. That has nothing to do with our business. Uh, I doubt seriously that you could calculate an impairment of the value of the company based on something like that. You got something a little more objective? First of all, Chick-fil-A is the worst thing ever. I don't know why people, I hear people, oh, Chick-fil-A is so good. I went there, I was like, am I supposed to eat the box or the food here? Do you guys like that? It's awful. I'd rather eat McDonald's. But anyway, maybe I was thinking about the guy though the whole time. I couldn't get him out of my head. So, okay. So yeah, typically, you know, I mean, there might be something weird. You know, I mean, I don't want to like go real horrific here. Plane crash, right? I mean, planes crash is part of doing business, and you can definitely have a severe impact on your goodwill. You know, if you have a plane crash, right? So these tend to be things that are in the normal course of business. Uh, interest expense? Non-operating. General and administrative? Operating. Operating. Good. Now, they tell us how many shares, so we're going to take our net income minus any preferred dividend, which they didn't tell us about any preferred dividend. So it's going to be net income divided by the shares for our earnings per share, right? And they give us the tax rate because we have to do what? We have to calculate our income tax, so that's going to be tax, isn't it? Right? The tax section of the income statement? Okay. Okay, good. So, um, hey guys, this may not be a bad way to approach it on the exam. Maybe, I don't know. No, nah, I don't know. You have to do that, but you would array them accordingly in a multiple step income statement. So you take a look, sales minus cost of goods sold is 
gross profit. There's our operating, and they put the goodwill there. That gives us our total operating expenses, gives us operating income. I would like you to call these out as non-operating. You don't have, I don't know, I guess you don't have to, but those are non-operating items the interest, the gain on the sale of investment. Uh, so I was wrong, it was what? Oh no, gain on sale of investment. The one, oh no, the unrealized is gonna be AFS. So gain on sale of investment was the non-operating on the actual sale, the 120. Interest, interest expense, that gives us what? In, uh, income before taxes, and then we take our Income tax expense, which is the 650. Did they show us how to calculate that? 650,000 times what? 0.4 should give us that number. 260,000. There's my net income. I take my net income and I divide that by what? The 300,000 shares. Gives me that 130. Okay, now that was if we just asked for a multiple step income statement, right? I could sit there and say, hey, give me the statement of comprehensive income, and statement of comprehensive income will do what? Start with my net income, and then go ahead and give me the unrealized gain on investment and the foreign currency, and those have to be what? Net of tax, because we're adjusting them to net income. Or we could have what? We could have a continuous approach in which we just go ahead and keep going. We call out our net income and then we come out with our OCI items and then that gives us our comprehensive income. Don't get tricked guys, notice what? The earnings per share is still on net income, isn't it? Not on comprehensive income. Well, I'm going to have to call that out. That's an ambiguity in the question that shouldn't have happened. You, you need to know. Okay. Because there are unrealized gains on trading securities that are part of net income. Uh, of, uh, uh, net income. It's non operating, but it's net income, right? So it'd be up in the non operating section? Yes, sir. Well, that's a good that's a good point too. Maybe that's what they wanted you to figure out without knowing really anything about the operations of this company. But yeah, typically a retail company like this is probably not going to have trading securities because they're not actively trading those on a day-to-day -day basis, whereas a bank, most everything would probably be trading securities. So that's a good point. That's a good observation. But I'm going to call, I'll call it out. You know, I don't expect you to sit here and use the force to figure out, you know, what kind of business is this? But you're right, a retail entity like this that's calling out the cost to get sold and whatnot, or they could even be, I doubt they're manufacturer because they're not talking about raw materials or any of that kind of stuff, but if they were manufacturer, They'd have a cost of goods sold, and probably they're not actively trading security. Well, that went a lot faster than I thought it would, so that's good, though. In general, questions. Which one? Yeah, you mean this just to just have the OCI? Uh, all you do with that is you start, you, 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 remember there's the one statement approach, the two statement approach. This one where we showed you the income statement and then we came to this is the two statement approach. And under the two statement approach, you just take the net income from the income statement, start with that, and then you make your adjustments for your other comprehensive income items on that second piece of paper, if you will. That's all that's happening there. The continuous is the one piece of paper approach, uh, one statement approach. I used to call it one piece of paper. It doesn't have to be one piece of paper, but the one statement approach. Where notice it's exactly the same up to net income, and then all we did was keep going with the OCI items on the one statement. 
So they give both options. I think when we looked at Apple, uh, they do the two statement approach, and a lot of companies do because they don't want their they don't want traffic on their income statement. They don't want a bunch of stuff there that's confusing people. So they like to have a pure, clean income statement, and then they go ahead and give you a second statement where they call out co other comprehensive income. Um, the line items for net income, you mean? I don't know what's going on with that. Comprehensive income should be the same. It's a, it's a, it's a typo. Three hundred seventy-eight thousand. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Gotta watch them test banks. It should be exactly the same. Should be exactly the same. All it is is how we're pre the only difference, guys, is how we're presenting the information. One, we're saying here's our income statement, our net income. Okay, flip to the next piece of paper. Here's our other comprehensive income. Here's our comprehensive income. In the one statement approach, it just keeps going. But the bottom line should be the same. That's a good catch. Questions about the test in general? Or specific questions about any of the material? Question 25 and 26. Guys, pay attention to your classmates' question because likely they have something... Um, well, I'm sure they have something valuable. I shouldn't say likely. Okay, so 25. This one? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, if you have a change in principle that that is inseparable from a change in estimate, Treat it as a changing estimate. Okay. For example, I'm going to give the same example, and then I'm going to give you a different one. Okay. Um, I'm using double declining balance depreciation. Double declining balance depreciation takes a lot of depreciation in the early years of an asset, less depreciation in the later years. Okay. So let's say I, for three years, use double declining balance. In the fourth year, I decide to change the straight line. Now, am I telling you that I now think that that asset depreciates evenly over its life, or have I just decided to change the principle by going to a new depreciation method, right? And it could be looked at either way. FASB came down and said, change in accounting estimate that is inseparable from a change in accounting principle is handled as a change in, change in estimate. And if it's a change in estimate, then I simply use that new estimate and go forward with it in the future. I would just calculate my depreciation expense in the calculation of my net income or my income from continuing operations. You want another example or you're good one? Okay, good. Because the next example was going to blow your mind, I think, so I'm glad you didn't have to go to. You want it? Okay. There's... Um, there's a method of accounting for sales called the installment method. And under the installment method, what happens is I don't take any profit on that sale until I begin to collect some cash on that sale. Okay. Now, FASB says that I should use the allowance method. I shouldn't sit there and worry about whether I've collected any cash at the time of sale. Even if I haven't collected any cash yet at the time of sale, I simply take an allowance for bad debts and I take bad debt expense. So let's say a company, but they say if you have no way of predicting profitability, then you should use the installment method, which is more conservative. Now let's say a company goes along and all of a sudden they get information that allows them to determine collectability. And so they want to change to the allowance method instead of the installment method. Is that a change in principle or a change in estimate? Because now you believe you have the information that allow you to calculate whatever the uh, uncollectability is. Treat it as a change in estimate and just go forward using now 
the allowance method when you don't have to restate or anything like that. Yeah. Told you we would be like, huh? Because we haven't studied installment method yet. I think chapter five we get into it, and I'll mention it again then, and it'll make probably make a little more sense. Questions? Yes. Yes. Um, the way to look at notes, the way we're talking about them primarily here, is um, there's two main things we talked about as it relates to notes. One is a related party disclosure, which is a footnote disclosure. We talked a little bit about that and how that has to be disclosed. Related party transactions are fine, but they have to be disclosed. And it's about the nature of the transaction, et cetera, that has to be disclosed. The other thing uh, that we talked about with disclosure related to um, uh, the summary of significant accounting policies. Summary of significant accounting policy is the first footnote that you see in any set of financials. And so I might try to trick you into saying, uh, should the company disclose information about um, potential product liability in the summary of significant accounting policies. No, summary of significant accounting policies is stuff like this is our depreciation method, this is how we calculate, this is how we define cash equivalents, those sort of things. So you would disclose in your footnote information about product liability suit or something like that, yes, but it is not that first in that footnote summary of significant accounting policy. Let's see someone on this side, out of the corner of my eye. Questions? Okay, guys, I'm going to go ahead and uh, post this up on Canvas. Um, if you have questions and you want to hang around to ask those, uh, my other classes will start till 3, so I'll be right here. If you want to ask me questions on Wednesday, I'll probably be here in my office, or, you know, 1230-ish, if you've got any last minute stuff. Okay, otherwise I'll see you 130. Are you bringing a Scantron? Yes. You gotta bring that skinny green Scantron, okay? And um, I'll bring the test. You bring the calculator, a pencil, <coughs> an eraser, and your brain. No open notes, no notes. Okay, guys. Okay, I will. Thank you.